for months, all of us have been personally or professionally battling COVID-19 or both. This global public health crisis has inflicted terrible physical, mental, emotional, financial, and spiritual strain on billions of people around the world. Yet, during these challenging times, another crippling disease has taken root across our nation. We are now facing an infodemic that is, unfortunately, impacting some of our friends, colleagues, and loved ones. To confront the issue of disinformation during this pandemic, I asked Susan Denser to join us to shed light on this critically important issue. For 10 years, Susan was the former on-air health correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Additionally, she was the editor-in-chief of the policy journal Health Affairs and is currently a senior policy fellow for the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. I'm grateful to have Susan on our podcast to confront the infodemic scourge plaguing many of our communities and the opportunity to learn from her how we can work together to move the health of our nation forward. Work that must be based on facts and science. Let's go. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Susan, welcome to our podcast. It's an honor to have you on today. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great to be here with you. Well, I'm eager to discuss with you the era of disinformation we are currently living in and also happening at the same moment of a global public health crisis that is the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to visit passionatepioneers.com in order to share your feedback and ideas. Simply scroll to the comments section at the bottom of each posted episode. And lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. All right, Susan, before we dive in and really start discussing this disinformation, this feeling of dystopia that we've been living in, and then, of course, putting it against the pandemic, I want to hear a little bit of your journey. It is an action-packed journey you've been on for many years, pushing the healthcare industry forward for being an author a filmmaker, editor of Health Affairs, and then the on-air health correspondent for the PBS NewsHour for 10 years. Take our community on that journey. How did all that evolve? How did that come to be? And then we'll dive into the topic at hand. Uh, well, thanks, Mike, for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. So I have been a lifelong journalist. I'm now not actively in day-to-day -day journalism, but I've never abandoned the techniques of journalism curiosity, inquiry, writing, and reporting in various ways. I came up through, I worked for many years for the old Newsweek magazine. I actually was the Wall Street correspondent for a while. I moved into business and economics coverage. And then just really in a fluke, one day my editor handed me a story to do on the for-profit hospital companies, the investor-owned companies, which for the first time, ever were trying to make entry into the markets in the Northeast, which at the time was technically illegal because of laws in the Northeast and states like Massachusetts and New York against the so-called corporate practice of medicine. But these companies were trying to make an entrance. Um, the company that was then the original Hospital Corporation of America was trying to buy McLean Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital affiliated with Harvard. And this was causing quite a stir, lots of editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine against it, et cetera, et cetera. So my editor said, go do a story about this. So I did. It was interesting. It happened to be about the time that the federal government was beginning to phase in diagnosis-related groups and prospective payment in the Medicare system, inpatient Medicare. And everybody thought the sky was going to fall in and all hospitals in America were going to go out of business because this was going to be such a draconian change. Mm 
And the more I learned about that, I thought, you know, this is really interesting. And there's barely anything in the general news media about this. This was a big story. So at that point, I got hooked on coverage of healthcare as a business, which, believe it or not, even then seemed like an arcane subject. I went off and had a fellowship at Harvard. I spent that year focusing on health policy. I moved to U.S. News and World Report as the chief economics correspondent for 10 years, but with a major carve out of my time devoted to the health policy battles of that era. And then I went to the PBS NewsHour and was the on-air correspondent there covering health, created the first health unit that the PBS NewsHour had had at that point, did that for 10 years, and then joined Health Affairs, where I really tried to substantially remake the journal to make it much more, you know, not to brag on myself, but I think we made it more interesting. We certainly made it more timely, and we undertook a lot of other innovations, including moving massively onto the internet. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. That gets me up at least till about five or six years ago. Then I spent several years as the senior policy advisor for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I ran a small nonprofit focused on innovation. And now I'm at the Margolis Center, which is the arm of Duke University, focused on health policy across all the different Duke schools. We're based in Washington, D.C. and focus heavily on policy issues at the federal level, including in particular for the last 10 months, obviously, the pandemic. Wow, what a storied career. What a storied journey. Thank you so much for sharing that, Susan. I do have to ask, back in 2015, you wrote and hosted a documentary, Reinventing American Healthcare, focusing on the innovations pioneered by the Geisinger Health System. What was it like writing and hosting a documentary? And I asked that for an audience of one right at this moment. I'm so curious of what it must be like to write and host a documentary. I'd love to do it myself. Well, television is always a team effort, so I can't take full credit for it. We had a terrific producer, obviously production crew, et cetera. And particularly the vision of the leadership of Geisinger at the time, uh, the CEO, Glenn Steele, They were coming up on the 100th anniversary of Geisinger, and Glenn really wanted to tell the Geisinger story. And I had covered that story for a number of years at Health Affairs and elsewhere and agreed. I thought it was a really interesting story of a system that was not in a part of the country that you necessarily think of as at the forefront of innovation in central Pennsylvania and was had really engineered a lot of very important changes in healthcare delivery and in, even in the payment system. Geisinger also has, and still to this day, has a health insurance branch, and that gave them an area where they could innovate because if they did things that saved money in healthcare, that redounded to the benefit of their internal payer, their health insurance arm, and that gave them an ability, as I say, to undertake some innovations that other systems that were entirely dependent on fee-for-service care and volume of care just could not undertake and retain their uh, financial viability. So there was a really good set of stories to tell about Geisinger. And I teamed up, as I say, with these other folks. Writing a piece like that is kind of like writing the hundreds of pieces that I wrote for years that I also reported on at the news hour. So it was just like doing a very, very, very long television piece, but I think we created a really good testament to what a system can do with enlightened leadership and the right ingredients in place to really try to innovate in healthcare. That is so cool and big fan of of Geisinger Health System. They have done some wonderful work up in the Northeast and it is obvious and very evident, Susan, there is many topics that we could discuss with you. Again, your career so storied, so celebrated. I guess we're just going to have to have you back on for several episodes because there is so much to discuss, everything from what you just uh, shared with us and now with your current work at Duke University. But I'm looking forward to discussing the very perplexing topic of disinformation happening during the pandemic after we get back from thanking our community champion sponsor. As the scope and complexity of revenue cycle management grows, especially during these unprecedented times, Ensemble is leading the industry in revenue cycle management performance, ensuring their partners rank among the top performing health systems in the country. On average, Ensemble is improving their clients' cash collections by 4 to 6%, lowering unbilled days to less than three, 
and their client's first pass denial rate is now 4.5%, better than Healthcare Financial Management Association's industry best practice. Ensemble's work in lifting revenue cycle performance helps providers buy new, durable medical equipment, hire more physicians, and expand their facilities. Ensemble is proud to be helping the flagships of American healthcare to better support the communities they serve. And speaking of community, we are incredibly grateful for Ensemble support and community champion sponsorship of Passionate Pioneers. To learn more about Ensemble and the passionate mission they are on, head over to EnsembleHP.com or visit the episode notes and click on their link. We are back with Susan Denser and we have so much to discuss after hearing her story journey in healthcare, all the things that she's accomplished. We're going to really focus in on today of this notion of disinformation, this era we're living in, and then having it juxtaposed against this public health crisis that is the coronavirus pandemic. So Susan, again, you spent over 10 years as the on-air host for the PBS NewsHour, editor of Health Affairs. Have you ever seen an era like we are in currently with disinformation from your story journey in being a reporter? Have you ever seen anything like this? I don't think any of us would have thought that we would have disinformation and misinformation to this degree in the pandemic. I mean, we've always had misinformation, disinformation. That's any journalist will tell you that for years, especially in Washington. I always bumped up against a lot of disinformation and misinformation about health policy, for example, and often saw the flames fanned over things that really people didn't fully understand. So people who had agendas were able to exploit lack of information and knowledge and lead people to believe things about topics that really weren't completely accurate. Let's put it that way. So that's not new. The degree of this is what's really alarming, frankly, and particularly the disagreement and sense that science really doesn't matter, that assertions by famous people matter more than the science does. That, I think, I certainly would not have expected to see to this degree in such a situation as we have now with the pandemic. What do you attribute it to? Again, you've been through this for years now, being a frontline and being a leader for our industry and reporting around healthcare. What are some of the levers that are being pulled that maybe weren't there in the past? Is it social media? Is it living in these tribal type of uh, you know news feeds in regards to information, other areas? What is driving this current state that we're in? All of the above. I mean, for example, let's take the fact that early on in the pandemic, the whole discussion of the pandemic became so politicized. As we know, we had a president who was basically largely denying the existence of it. He has a lot of followers. We've just seen that in the latest election with more than 70 million people voting for him. If somebody who has that kind of power over a following tells you that something is not so, then you believe it. And to believe otherwise would have been to reject that person's views. So I think that was a dynamic. Whoever would have thought we would have something like that, where something that was so patently obvious that we had this deadly pathogen among us could be denied out of existence. Okay, so we had that. Then we have the whole social media and other enterprise that fans those kinds of beliefs and extremist versions of that. We had QAnon, right, <laughs> which you know wasn't with us a few short years ago. So that played an additional role. I think the confusion that then resulted in what some of the public health authorities were saying We had a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that frankly was pretty much emasculated through the very early parts of this crisis. That's not typical. The CDC, you know, as a reporter, I covered instances where there were initially false starts. For example, when the anthrax attacks happened back in 2001, it took a while for the federal government to get its act together about who was saying what about those attacks. But it only took a couple of weeks. And then everybody got their story straightened out. And the CDC in particular emerged to speak with a very clear voice about what it knew and what it didn't know 
about what was behind those attacks. We didn't have that this time around. We had a, just a series of statements and retractions and then infighting among the public health authorities. And then finally, just a major abdication of a lot of the federal role in speaking clearly about the pandemic and handing it off to states. And the states themselves were in the throes of politics, even in states where governors were trying to speak with a very clear voice, putting in place lockdowns, putting in place mask mandates, et cetera. They got phenomenal pushback. I have a good friend, very good friend, the health commissioner of Minnesota, who actually was getting death threats. Somebody got a hold of her cell phone and started leaving death threats on her cell phone. So this is just not normal. Let's put it that way. And I think, as you said, all these different forces have come together to create the situation that we're in now. I had a conversation with a healthcare executive a number of weeks ago, and it really applies to this conversation we're having today here, Susan. And it's this notion around community, meaning, you know, in years prior, before living in these tribes or living in these, you know, information-filled vacuums that only really give you information that you want to hear about as opposed to opposing views, we would be part of book clubs or the bowling league or a softball league or church. And if I had a radical view like QAnon, my bowling teammates would call me out on it. I would be challenged and would be told, that it doesn't sound factually correct, Mike. Do you see that being an issue as well, this tearing apart of society and getting into these very focused tribes where we're only hearing a certain type of information and it's not being, frankly, checked? What are your thoughts there, Susan? I think it's happening throughout the professions. The New York Times a couple of days ago had an op-ed by Richard Friedman, who's a psychiatrist in New York, who put on the table, why is it that you can have physicians going out now, speaking out loudly about the pandemic, telling complete falsehoods about it? Witness Scott Atlas, who was, of course, for a short period of time, the president's top health advisor, basically saying face masks don't work, social distancing is a fraud, et cetera. He's the president's health advisor for a period of time. Where was the collective medical community calling him out in such a way that it really uh, cast a very cold light on the fact that he just did not know what he was talking about? Now, many were doing that sort of on a one-off basis, but as uh, Dr. Friedman said in his op-ed, somebody like that, really, why would a state not revoke somebody's medical license for basically telling falsehoods that are going to imperil public health, and individual health? It's a good question. Most of us don't know how to deal with this other than to decry it, bemoan it, et cetera. But in terms of an organized effort to really suppress the misinformation and disinformation, we don't really have that. And let's talk about those journalists that are trying to do it. This is an interesting topic that I've recently learned about as well that I didn't know this, that We know that disinformation is very dangerous. We're watching it happen in real time. But journalists find themselves in a very difficult position when investigating it. While politicians might say something that's obviously not true, journalists generally don't outright accuse them of being a liar, of spreading disinformation. That's because journalists cannot be usually 100% certain of the intent behind the misinformation or disinformation And they can be sued for libel if they're wrongfully call somebody a liar. How does journalists that are trying to square with this era, how do they handle this time of calling it out, but then also, you know, watching themselves of being sued for libel? How do you square that? Well, it's hard to be sued for libel over any of these issues. It's more likely that you'll just be, you know, the target of wrath by by the people on the other side. But I think I've obviously watched a lot of my colleagues cope in this era, and people are getting comfortable, very comfortable, pointing out that things that are said by public officials are just not true. It used to be that the convenient dodge of journalism was to say, okay, well, if person X says this, we'll find somebody on the other side, and that person's saying why, and everything will come out fine in the wash. I think 
journalists by and large and the press by and large has recognized that that's not sufficient. You have to call out falsehoods as falsehoods, as lies. There is no such thing as a set of alternative facts, but you can do it in a way that doesn't necessarily question that person's motive or pune that person's mission, but just say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. This is just not right. And I think, you know, another example of that, you had uh, Senator Ron Johnson, a Wisconsin member of Congress, Republican member of Congress, who brought up two of these nutso doctors to testify last week saying masks don't work, social distancing doesn't work. The reporting on that was pretty clear that these people were fringe people, that what they were saying was not true. What was Senator Johnson's motive in bringing them up? I don't pretend to know, but I do know that he brought up two people who just told major falsehoods to the American public. End of story. Yeah, it's fascinating to say the least that these are our nation's leaders and we're bringing up these fringe, quote unquote, thought leaders. It's just, again, just an era that we're living in that is so perplexing to me. But let's talk about the near and long term effects, Susan. I want to go first uh, talk about the near term and what's in front of us right now. Here we are, uh, end of 2020, uh, as we record this episode, about to go over 300,000 fatalities in the U.S., And we're now hearing from nurses and frontline healthcare heroes across the country that some of the patients on their last breath and dying are still saying to their care providers that this is a hoax, that this is not real. How do we get people in our communities across the country out of these tribal vacuums of information and mistruths that even on your last dying breath, you still think it's fake? How do we break this cycle? How do we get out of these vacuums of misinformation? Well, sad to say, I think that the more people contract the virus and more people who are seriously ill because of the virus and more people who die because of the virus, sooner or later, most Americans are going to know somebody in all of those categories. And let's hope that that recognition of the facts eventually wins the day and people do understand not everybody is equally harmed by this virus, but are many people seriously harmed by the virus and in fact killed by the virus? Yes. And as I say, I think the growing numbers will convey that message to people. There was a heartbreaking story in today's New York Times about people now writing obituaries for their loved ones, putting in, first of all, that they died of COVID, and then saying, you know, more or less, please, in honor of our deceased loved one, please wear a mask. You know, please stop pretending that this is nothing because, frankly, this person is now dead because of it. That's heartbreaking. I think maybe if there's enough of that, it will start to get some attention. But, you know, all of this is up against, as we were saying earlier, some very, very powerful forces, not just the social media and and other news bubbles or not news, true alternative fact attempt creating vehicles. It's up against all of that. It's also up against some very deliberate, subversive, for example, anti-vax movement, which is, you know, partly not so conspiracy QAnon stuff. And also we know that there have been Russian and other trolls behind some of the anti-vax material that's appeared on various websites. So there's a really concerted effort here on the part of Russians and others to destabilize democracy with things like fanning the anti-vax movement. So I think, you know, again, we've got to find as much of that and root it out as much as possible. There are people who've been waging wars to get Facebook and others to take down these anti-vax messages, for example and basically remove that from these very powerful social media sites where it really does only fan the flames of misinformation and disinformation. So that's one proactive thing that can be done. But the other piece is just people speaking out and not being shy anymore. Again, you don't have to question somebody's motives, but you can tell them that they're just factually incorrect in what they're saying in terms of not believing in the existence of the coronavirus or believing that it can be as harmful as in fact it is. If we don't call this out, Susan, if we don't bring it, you know, into the light and call 
this era of disinformation, misinformation that we're living in, this fanning the flames of just like you mentioned, what are the long-term impacts for our society, our nation, and the world? Well, it's very troubling to many of us that science is getting such short shrift. And I think, you know, frankly, a piece of that goes back to the culture wars and battles to take evolution out of textbooks and things like that. We had a young woman helping my family take care of our kids years ago who told my 12-year-old, who my son who was then 12 at the time, who was a major science jock, she told him that the world had been created by God 10,000 years ago. Well, you want to see culture clash, you know, a smart 12-year-old who's on a science track taking on the notion that there was no such thing as evolution, that that was an eye-opener for, even for my husband and me. This doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, people are, are in some parts of this country are being taught that in schools, not just in religious institutions. And if that's the basis on which people go forward into life, you know, what they learned about science when they were 6 and 10 and 12 years old, that's going to have long-term repercussions of it and fueling this kind of distrust and lack of belief, a lack of faith in science that we now have. And I think, again, with sort of reinventing the entire U.S. educational system, I don't know how you combat that, but it's very clear we have a big set of divides in this country. We've got divides between those who are college-educated and not, urban versus rural, and many other respects. And I think all of these divides, in fact, create a dynamic where you have, you have of the possibility of people having completely different sets of beliefs and understandings about the world and about reality. I don't know how you begin to attack that if you don't start with uh, basic education. Susan, do you have hope for the future in regards to this notion of disinformation just affecting all aspects of our society? Do you have hope? I have hope, yes. One can always hope, but hope is different from having any kind of degree of certainty that we're going to fix this, right? I think it's going to be a long-term proposition, but I think we can't hide from the fight, right? We're going to have to continue to think of ways to curb the sources of disinformation that pay no penalty for being sources of disinformation, really. I mean, that's the key thing. That's why you want to go after Facebook and put pressure on Facebook to pull anti-vax sites off for the platform. You can't just leave it to, you know, chance that people are going to come and see the light of day on their own. You've got to take active action against sources of misinformation and disinformation. That's why I really thought it was interesting for Dr. Friedman to say, where are state medical boards in this? Do they have a responsibility to weigh in here? Or should they just abdicate and say, well, this speech, if this doctor wants to tell people that they should drink bleach, you know, okay, right? We've really got to look within ourselves and our institutions and say, are we doing everything that we possibly could be doing? at this point to stamp out misinformation and disinformation, particularly when it jeopardizes uh, public health. I think the onus is on every entity within society to ask whether it has a role in redressing this terrible situation. Well, thank you for that, Susan. And I do appreciate the candor and the honest feedback for all of us to contemplate during these times. Let's pivot a little bit away from your previous work as one of our national leading Voices for Healthcare. And let's discuss current state, maybe have you do a little quick elevator pitch before we get out of here today. What's going on currently with your work as a senior policy fellow for the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University? What are you guys currently working on? Well, truly, since early March, we have been pretty much all COVID all the time, focusing on various aspects of the pandemic and the policy response to it. We've written a number of papers about, for example, COVID testing, trying to first of all clarify for people and policymakers what the situation was with respect to different types of tests, different availability of tests, different accuracy levels of tests, 
when it was appropriate to use certain tests and not others, et cetera. So we spent a lot of time on testing. We've spent a lot of time on vaccines and vaccine distribution. And of course, as we know, the largely the role of distributing the vaccines has been handed off to the states. That means that we have about 51 different vaccine distribution modalities that will take place among the states. We tried to put together some papers that suggested what do we think are going to evolve as best practices for governors and their advisors to undertake as they figure out how to get the vaccines out as they become more widely available to different entities within the population. So we've done a lot of work on that. And we also work on monoclonal antibodies, which have gotten much less attention than vaccines. But in terms of the need to respond in the here and the now to disease that is cropping up in the population, monoclonal antibodies are really just about the only other effective treatment besides remdesivir uh, for dealing with people with COVID in the early stages of the infection and COVID-19 disease. So trying to inject some clarity in that situation to enable people to understand just what was going to be necessary to do to get these drugs to the right people in the right place at the right time was a very important exercise because, again, these drugs have to be given to people in the early stages of the disease when they may not know that they're as sick as they are or about to become as sick as they're going to get. So making sure that people are aware of it, making sure doctors know about these drugs, and then getting them to people because these have to be infused into people. And ideally, you know, in a perfect world, we'd get them to people in their homes for infusion. We're not going to be able to do as much of that as we would like. So then we've got to figure out different infusion centers around the country where you can get these drugs to people. And that itself is a monumental task. Well, thank you for sharing that, Susan. Really do appreciate it. Before we sign off, where can we find you online, social media handles, websites, or otherwise, so we can continue to learn from you, follow your work, and get involved? Where can we find you online? So Twitter, at Susan Denser. LinkedIn, I post very frequently on LinkedIn. Just type in my name, Susan Denser, and it will very quickly find me. And then, of course, healthpolicy.duke.edu is our Robert J. Margolis website, and Many of the papers that we've contributed to and written are there. And then even just a good old Google search will pop up a lot of the other writings that I've done, including for the American Journal of Public Health, New England Journal of Medicine, Catalyst, and elsewhere. Excellent. Thank you for that. We'll also leave those contact points in the episode notes. So in your podcast player, simply scroll down and click on through. And we will have them over at passionatepioneers.com and Susan's episode post there where you can also leave comments and feedback for Susan and the rest of the community. Again, passionatepioneers.com. Well, Susan, thank you so much for taking a pit stop to be on our podcast today and to share your message and your expertise on a topic that's incredibly important right now, this notion of disinformation and misinformation during the pandemic and beyond. We appreciate your perspective and your time to be with us and our community. For now, Thank you again for all your work, Susan. We're so glad that you spent time with us today. Thanks so much, Mike. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.